The title of the message today is The House Rules. The rules of the house. You know, in every family, there are rules about how you behave within the house. If you're going to live in this house, then you're going to follow our rules. And when you get up and marry and leave home, then you can have your own rules. But until you leave this house, you're going to go by my rules, right? Well, this Torah portion discusses the house rules for the Kohanim, for the priests. And it's informally referred to as the Torot Kohanim. In other words, the, the instruction manual of the priests, a very special class of people within the Levites. And I've found four or five uh, main topics within this one chapter that govern the house rules. And number one is respect. It's very important uh, not for the priest's own family to respect him and therefore respect the name of the one who has appointed him and anointed him. But it's also important for the whole community of Israel to respect the Kohen, to respect the priest. And since we are a kingdom of priests, what this is teaching us is how to respect one another, how to hold one another in high esteem. That's one of the rules of the house. And it says very pointedly, in chapter 21, verse 8, You, Israel, shall consecrate him, therefore. For he offers the food, it should say the bread, lechem, it's specifically the bread of your God. He shall be holy to you, Israel. For I, the Lord, who sanctifies you, am holy. In other words, by, by offering the respect, by sanctifying and making holy, your priest, you are sanctifying and making holy Hashem. And what's interesting is, this is so important, at least in Judaism, that still yet in the synagogues, the Levites and the Kohanim, if they come from those families, are given special privileges within the synagogue. They might be the first one called up to read from the Torah. Those are the ones who will give the priestly blessing and so forth. And uh, if they're reluctant, then it, it falls upon the regular Israelites sitting in the pews to encourage them and kind of push them into fulfilling their obligations and their duties as priests in Israel, even though there is no temple. They still afford them an esteem and a respect. Now, we know this is still important because Paul models it for us in Acts 23. Remember, Paul has been taken before the Sanhedrin. And here's what it says. Shaul, looking steadfastly at the council, said, Brothers, I have lived before God in all good conscience until this day. The Kohen Gadol, Hananiah, commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Shaul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you sit to judge me according to the law? and command me to be struck contrary to the law? Those who stood by said, Do you malign the God's Kohen Hagadol? Shaul said, I didn't know, brothers, that he was the Kohen Gadol, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. You see, in an instance where the priest is obviously wrong, where the, the high priest has obviously broken the Torah by commanding Paul to be struck on the mouth, Nevertheless, when Paul realizes that he is the high priest, he apologizes. And he didn't curse the priest, he just called him a name. He called him a whitewashed wall. I don't know what our equivalent of that would be. He just called him a name. But he instantly retracts the statement when he finds out that it's not just the high priest, 
It's an incorrect high priest. He's not functioning the way that he is called to function in his high priesthood. Nevertheless, Paul says, I respect his office even if I don't respect what he's doing. If I don't under, you know, respect his interpretation of the law, I still respect his office. I retract the statement. I was wrong. And he quotes scripture. You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. What he's quoting is Exodus 22:28. It says, you shall not curse God nor curse a ruler of your people. So it doesn't just apply to the curse, Paul says. You don't have to come right out and curse another member of the royal priesthood. But if you simply call them names, you should take it back. If you know that they are priests before the Most High, take it back. Don't even speak evil of them and speak names about them. And I think, you know, it, it talks about rulers of your people. Our president, even if you don't like the president, if he's the president, once he's elected, you owe him the respect of his office, even if you don't agree with his deeds that he's doing. And it's very popular now for the political parties, depending on who's in power, for the other one to really give the president a hard time and say ugly things. But according to Exodus 22, 28, in this royal priesthood that we live in, we owe a ruler of our people respect, even if we don't agree with what he's doing. We don't call him names. We can disagree with his deeds, but we can't call him names. Next is to respect your father and mother, which is equal to keeping the Shabbat. We read in the previous Torah portion from a, a section called Kedoshim. It says, you shall revere every man his mother and his father and keep my Shabbatot. You shall revere your mother and father and keep my Sabbaths. Those are equal. They're equal to one another. Because respect for your parents, even your physical parents, is equal to offering respect for honoring the Shabbat. In Matthew 15, 1, we see something interesting here. And it has to do with honoring and respecting your father and mother. Some of the Pharisees and scribes came to Yeshua from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And he answered and said to them, Why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother. And he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever I have that would help you has been given to God, he is not to honor his father or his mother, and by this you have invalidated the word of God for the sake of your tradition. Honoring our father and our mother is part of respect for the Holy One of Israel. If we don't honor our father and mother, we transgress the commandment of God. And we see that in this Torah portion, the sons and daughters of a priest have an even higher obligation than the average to show them respect because the priesthood models for all Israel how a family should function. Priestly children should be even more respectful of their father and mother than the average. Our children should be even more respectful of their father and their mother than every other child that they come into contact with in the community. They should be a cut above everyone else because they are modeling to the other children. You see, even a child, the proverb says, is known by his deeds, whether they're good or bad. Even your small children will be known by other children and their parents by the amount of respect that he shows you as a father or mother. And he or she will be modeling what it means to be a royal priesthood to the community in general. They will be motivating them and elevating the children around them to a higher level of holiness by their own example. The next category is uh, having to do with the consumption of the holy food, the, the bread that's brought in, the flesh and so forth that's brought in, and then the portion we know is given to the Levites and the priests. Again, children in a priestly family have both privileges of eating that bread and flesh of the sacrifices, but they also have the obligation, just as we do. If we are children of the great high priest, then not only do we have the privilege of eating the bread of life, we also have responsibility 
to our high priest to do the will of the Father. What did Yeshua say his bread and his meat was? To do the will of the Father. That's as we consume the bread and the flesh, the bread of life, and the flesh that was offered for us, that means that we will do the will of the Father. That we will do the will of not just our earthly father, but our heavenly father. That we will respect the house rules. And by doing his will, we are eating the same bread as the children of the high priest ate. But our obligation is high. It says in Proverbs 28, 24, He who robs his father or his mother and says, It's no transgression. He is a companion of a destroyer. That's a heavy statement because the sages have established, and the scripture backs it up again if we had a lot of time to go into it, that his father is none other than the Holy One of Israel. If you transgress his commandments, the father's commandments, and you say there's not a transgression here, even though scripture clearly defines what you're doing as a transgression, and you say it's not a transgression because I'm under some other rule. No, you're not. You live in a priestly household. You are obligated to keep the Father's rules. And if you choose not to, it says that you are the companion of a destroyer. You are destroying the house. Who is your mother? Your mother is the congregation of Israel. That is showing respect to your mother, and that is consistent with the message that the prophets give us over and over, that the congregation of Israel is the bride. It is the bride of Hashem. It is the bride that is to be offered without spot, without wrinkle. Even Yeshua says, who are my mother and brothers? It's the people who eat the bread of life, who do the will of the Father who sent him. Those who are eating the food that is dedicated to the priesthood. Those are my mother and brothers. So it's the job of the Levites and the priest's children to tend to the congregation of Israel. That is how they show respect for their mother. There are other house rules. Sexual purity in a priestly household. No harlotry. We know that it goes on, but we know this was like rule number one when the Gentiles came in to the synagogues. No sexual immorality. We see this is founded in the priestly household as well. Don't marry a harlot. Don't give your daughter to harlotry. We talked a couple weeks ago about nakedness and approaching people in their nakedness. None of these things should be found in a priestly household. Again, we are the standard for everyone else. We are cut above in our behavior, in our speech, so that everyone around us can look up and say, that is a priestly family. That is a royal priesthood, and that is how they act. That is how they behave, and I want to emulate what they're doing. I want to walk like them. Even though a priest with physical defects, I thought it was funny, you know, if you've seen people that have the one eyebrow that goes all the way across, they couldn't be a high priest because they couldn't go, into the, they couldn't go near the curtain near the Holy of Holies, or if you had a flat nose. There's all sorts of physical defects. If the limb had been broken, they couldn't set it like we can, so it was not going to heal correctly. If you'd had a broken limb, you couldn't be a high priest. Nevertheless, even though some part of you was defective, you were still entitled to eat the bread and the flesh of the sacrifices that was set aside for the priesthood. And... Uh, it, you see that there's provision made, even for the defective kohanim, the defective person in the family. They simply can't get into that holy of holy of places because, like we said, the priests are the example. They are the teaching tool. We look at the high priest and we say, this is perfection. Even though in our minds we know he's human and he's not perfect, he is our human contact. We look at this high priest and say, that's what I want to be like. That's who I want to walk like. Throughout Moshe's life, Israel ate the bread of heaven. This is interesting. They were a royal priesthood. They were a nation of priests. And even though there were some problems with that generation, nevertheless, they were supplied with the bread from heaven. However, when they crossed over the Jordan and went into the promised land, 
Something changed. No longer did they receive the bread from heaven. It says that they began to eat the grain of the land. It says they did eat of the grain of the land on the morrow after the Passover. That's in Joshua 5.12. What's the difference? What's the difference between the bread that just fell directly out of heaven for this royal priesthood and the bread that they began to glean from the land? Well, one, they didn't have to work for. The other one, they had to work very hard in order to acquire it. One is from above, and one is from below. This is a picture of the kingdom. They were receiving supernatural bread out of the kingdom of heaven for 40 years while he molded them and nurtured them. He showed them huge miracles, great miracles. Miracles like that were going to be few and far in between once they entered into the land. The miracles would be scattered out, but they would not see the daily miracle of the manna and the water from the rock that followed them around the wilderness. They would no longer see these huge supernatural miracles. It was a sign that as they moved into the holy land, the physical land, that they were moving into a kingdom on earth. Israel represents, it is the icon, it is the thing that we look to that represents the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Because as goes Israel, so goes the whole earth. That is the belly button of the earth. And whatever is happening in Israel within its borders, good or bad, that is also going to affect, like the ripple effect, everything that happens throughout the whole earth. We cannot expect a supernatural Jerusalem to come down until there is repair made in the kingdom on earth, the Jerusalem below. And that is a sign to us that Moshe, who could not go into the Holy Land, he had to die before Joshua could take them over the Jordan. Those great supernatural interventions, that period was over when Moshe passed away. But then, once they crossed over the Jordan, Joshua, Yehoshua is his name in Hebrew, and Yeshua is a short form. The same root meanings are there. Yehoshua, Yeshua. It is Yeshua, Yehoshua, who actually leads us into the Holy Land to teach us how to establish, to do battle for, to hold the ground, to establish and to harvest in the kingdom on earth. Israel being the symbol of the kingdom on earth. It has to be rectified in that order. So if we are a royal priesthood, if we are going to eat the bread of the royal priesthood, we can not only eat manna from heaven, but we must learn to eat the bread that is produced in the land. And the only way that bread will be produced it's by the work of our hands. It's what we accomplish in the kingdom that determines this earthly bread that we receive. But Yeshua was the one who brought in with him the kingdom on earth beginning to mirror the kingdom that is in heaven. And that's how he taught us to pray. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we also have to continue like Joshua to teach people in the land to establish the kingdom on earth. Moshe represented the sun because remember his face had to be veiled. It was shining so brightly the people couldn't look at him. He represented the sun. But then the sun had to set before the moon could have any light at all. Joshua represents the moon. Because the moon has only the light that the sun which is set shines into it. The moon does not have light of its own. The sun does. So Joshua shows us how that we do the will of the Father on earth. We simply reflect the light of a sun that has been gathered to its place. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. The next aspect of the Torah portion, I think, is the living sacrifice. Because priests, the Kohanim, had such high standards, they were literally a living sacrifice. They were constantly sacrificing something for the house of Israel. Even the right to mourn 
actively over dead relatives, close dead relatives. If he were in the holy sanctuary and he heard that his wife or daughters had died, he could not leave to go follow that processional and to mourn with the family because he was set apart. He could not live in a realm of grief, pain, and mourning. He always lived in the presence of God, and he could not defile himself to step into that realm of grief, pain, and mourning. We are also a living sacrifice, according to that priesthood. It says in Romans 12, 1, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. You are a priesthood. And you have to be very careful not to step in those realms of pain, grief, and suffering. Romans 15, 16, to be a minister of Yeshua HaMashiach to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God. He was not a priest. He was ministering as a priest the same way that we do. So that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Your service is the same. You are ministering as a priest of reconciliation, bringing the nations in, everyone whose lives you touch. You want them also to become a living sacrifice, acceptable on the altar. And then 1 Peter 2.5, You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Yeshua HaMashiach. Your life is a living sacrifice the same way that the high priest was. And the final thing that I saw was the priests of Israel were different from the other nations in at least one respect. They taught the people how to live not how to die. In other religions, there's such a different set of rules because the priestly manual would be concealed from the average person. It was the priest who held this secret manual of understanding. And the average person had to go to the priest in order to obtain information or be told how to live. But in Israel, we're given, we're reading from the priestly manual. We're reading Leviticus. He's giving it to the people so that if the priest falls into sin, every person in the congregation will know that this priest is overtaken in sin. And there's a better chance it's going to be corrected simply because of the good old boy mentality. Priests take care of priests, right? You know, that's the way we function. But if you're accountable to everyone, for this priestly manual, and they are because we have it, then it's much harder to continue in sin and to abuse the office that you have. Uh, another thing is that in other religions, it's very much associated with death. And even though we have a sacrificial system, we are told that the life is actually in the blood that's offered but if you look at some of the traditions and the customs and the rituals, they're very death-oriented. Some of the things that are done at funerals are morbid. You know, um, They used to have parties in the cemeteries of the dead and have drink and food offerings and this sort of stuff. Even in life, they were very much acquainted with death. But look at the Egyptians. What did the priests of Egypt write? The Book of the Dead. Now, how about your Bible being the book of the dead? We've got the tree of life. They have the book of the dead. So our priests teach us how to live, not how to die. In other cultures, they will try to mummify the body and make it last as long as it can. They want to keep trying to make this dead thing, you know, an object of concern. And they will put, they'll bury them with all the stuff. We've seen them buried with... Uh, armies made out of stone. We found them buried with their horses, with their wives, with their concubines, with boats, jewelry, food. You name it, they're buried with it. But in, in Scripture, all you're buried with is what you came in with. You'll be buried in a simple white outfit. Everyone is equal. Everyone is the same, and we want your flesh to deteriorate back to dust just as quickly as it possibly can so that all that is left is the bones. And hopefully we can talk about those bones someday and what they represent and why it was so important to hang on to the bones because that was important. 
Israelites want to speed the process of the decay of the flesh because that is the corruption. Let's get rid of the corruption. This body we've got is corruptible. But we want to put on incorruptibility. So the faster we get rid of the flesh, the better it is. But you want to keep the bones. The What do they call it? Where they burn the whole thing? Cremation. Cremation. Don't do that. Keep your bones. The... Uh, the burial customs of the nations are not like the burial customs of Israel because a royal priest teaches people how to live, not how to die. So what's emerging in us based on the precepts that we read about today? Well, there's also, and I think it's in an upcoming portion, it, it talks about specifically who in a priest's household can eat the holy bread and sacrifices and who cannot. If it is a hired servant, they cannot. But if it is one that has been purchased, one who has been purchased by that family, then that slave or that servant can indeed eat the bread of the sacrifices the same as the royal priesthood family. That's interesting because through Messiah's blood, we are not hired servants. We are not living in this household, but yet not partaking of the flesh and of the bread. We are in the household because we have been bought with a price, we have been purchased, and therefore we are part of the family. We can eat the same bread and eat the same flesh as the high priesthood. It is the food of God. It is the lechem of God, his bread. And as long as we remain his bought servants, we will perpetually be able to eat the bread of life. Why? How can we do this? Well, there's two things that Scripture defines, and that is to keep the Sabbath and to keep the covenants. And we'll see that in Isaiah, that it's by keeping the Sabbath and the covenants, by honoring your father and mother, which is honoring your father in heaven and your mother on earth, which is the congregation of Israel, you are at the same time a slave of the household and you are a priest, which is what Yeshua modeled for us being Mashiach ben Yosef, the suffering servant, and he will return as a conquering king, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek two aspects. We are at the same time both bought slaves and priests in the household. Um, the names of the priestly sons and daughters could be cut off if they married outside the household. Why? Because they were profaning their mother and their father's name and therefore profaning the name of the Holy One of Israel. If they were marrying into harlotry, if they were marrying into people of the nations, and not according to the instructions of the priesthood, their names would be cut off. They were no longer able to eat the holy bread or the holy flesh. They were separated from their family in that respect. Also, it says the one with crushed testicles. If there's been some sort of a problem um, with the reproductive system, this person could not enter the holy place. But in Messiah Yeshua, even if you have these defects, even if you have committed these things, there is a way made for you to draw near. Because the crushed testicles are the symbols of the dry tree, those who are fruitless in the kingdom. And we were all once dry trees. We were all once fruitless. We were all once eunuchs in the kingdom who brought forth no fruit. But through Messiah Yeshua, our names will not be cut off, and we will not be dry, fruitless trees. <clears throat> Isaiah 56, 3 through 8, and I read this quite a bit, but it, it's very important to us. It, this is something for our generation. It says, Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give in my house, in my temple, and within my walls a memorial, a zikaron, 
and a name better than that of sons and daughters. Better than the sons and daughters of the high priest. I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. You may have been cut off because you married outside of the family, because you married into the harlotry of the nations. But he's saying, if you will cling to my Sabbath, keep my covenants, your name will not be cut off. You'll have an everlasting name. Also, the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Remember the servants of the household? If you're bought with a price, you can eat. Everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. That is the master plan, not just for the high priest with no defects to approach with sacrifices, but for every person from every nation who desires to draw close, to keep the Sabbath, to keep the covenants. If they desire to draw close, then he says, I will accept their sacrifices because it will be a house of prayer for all the nations. What I'm giving you is a system that's going to be better as it evolves. Regardless of your ethnicity, keep the Sabbaths, keep the covenants, and you will receive the priestly privilege. Now there is a connection. You notice the B'chadasha reading had to do with a man's journey to Jericho. And Jericho is a very important city as it pertains to this Torah portion. And uh, the part that we read about Elisha's dealings there in chapter 2 of the Haftorah, I don't have time to do that today, talking about the two she-bears and why the little boys were saying, go up, baldy. Remember, in this Torah portion, it says, a priest shall not shave his head for the dead. There's a connection there. We'll, we'll deal with that some other time. But I want to read to you a little bit about Jericho. And I also printed off some information that's very interesting about a plant called the Rose of Jericho. And I'll try to make copies of this and bring it in Monday Night Bible Study so you can read it. It's an incredible plant. It seems like it's dead. It looks like a big lump of bones. But centuries later, you add a little water to it, and all of a sudden that thing opens up and starts dropping seeds and reproducing. And there's a connection with Jericho, and I think that's why it was named the Rose of Jericho. In the Bible Dictionary, Easton's Bible Dictionary, this is what you need to know about Jericho. It was the destination or the origin of both the priest and the Levite in the portion that we read today. In the first century, there were more priests and Levites living in Jericho than actually lived in Jerusalem. And it was a very dangerous path from Jerusalem to Jericho, very desolate, dangerous, barren. And robbers did roam loose in that area. But Jericho itself was a place of fragrance. It was a fenced city in the midst of a vast grove of palm trees. Remember the palm trees represent the righteous. In the plain of Jordan, over against the place where the Jordan was crossed by the Israelites. Its site was near Elisha's fountain, which we read about today, where he made the water sweet, about five miles west of the Jordan. It was the most important city in the Jordan Valley and the strongest fortress and all the land of Canaan. The city, you remember, was taken in a very remarkable manner. They circled it for seven days, blew seven times. Everything was done in sevens, which is the number of perfection, a supernatural number. But Jericho was a city accursed by God, which can also be rendered as harem, which is dedicated or consecrated to God. There can be a good or a bad aspect to Jericho's condition because it was devoted to Hashem. And we know that according to the instructions, all the inhabitants and all the spoil of the city were to be destroyed. It says only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and iron were reserved and put into the treasury of the house of Hashem. That's very interesting. Remember at Sukkot I taught about the silver, the gold, the brass vessels and how they were imperishable. 
Remember, there was one family that was rescued out of Jericho. It was Rahav, a harlot. She was a harlot, which a priest could not marry or put his daughter into harlotry. And she was an innkeeper. That's interesting because this wounded man was taken to an inn. But the only vessels of silver and gold in the human form that were removed and rescued and redeemed from Jericho was a harlot and her family. And they were put into the treasury. They became treasures in the house of Hashem. Now this city was given to the tribe of Benjamin. And it was inhabited in the time of the judges, but not mentioned again till David's time. In the return from the captivity from Babylon, it says that the children of Jericho were the ones, or some of the ones, who returned under Zerubbabel, and they helped to rebuild the city. Now, in New Testament times, the Jericho uh, was known as a rich and flourishing town. It had a lot of trade. The palm trees were important. And it was visited by Yeshua on his last journey to Jerusalem. The last city he visited before that week was Jericho because something important was going to happen there. First of all, he gave sight to two blind men, and then he brought salvation to the house of Zacchaeus, the publican, the tax collector. This is very interesting because right before the destruction of the temple, Jericho was destroyed. And for the last, guess how many years, it's been barren. 1,800 years, more or less. It was barren until Israel began to return. And now, by the time we get to the 1950s, it is once again the Jericho of Scripture, flourishing with palm trees, flourishing with aqueducts, and so forth. Barren for 1,800 years, but now restored. Jericho is rich in symbolism. What we're looking at in the parable that Yeshua told is a clear reference to a rabbinic law that was being discussed during that time period. You see, most of the priests and the Levites that functioned in this period were Sadducees. They were not Pharisees, even though the Pharisees had the support of the common person. It was the Sadducees who actually functioned. Sadducees did not believe in oral law. They followed the letter of the Torah, and they denied the resurrection. They said, it's not going to happen. When you're dead, you're dead. So this sheds a whole new light on what you've probably been told about why the priest and the Levite went around the wounded man. It was not the Pharisees who would have failed to deal with this wounded man. It was only a Sadducee or a Samaritan, because the Samaritans also only used the written law. They did not adhere to the oral law. What is written tells a priest or a Levite, if he tends to this wounded man who is half dead on the road to Jericho, then he is going to defile himself for the temple service and he can't do it. That's the letter of the law. That's the law of the Sadducees and the law of the Samaritan. But the Pharisees followed an oral law, which is using the spirit of the law, taking the body of the law, and interpreting from the complete body of Scripture, which we know is a Torah of kindness, of mercy, of being good to those who have fallen by the wayside. And so when the priests go around, they're, they're Sadducees. We, I can prove that to you from the book of Acts. Almost all of them are Sadducees. They go around because they're keeping the letter of the law. But the Samaritan comes up, he's got the same choice, he's got to make the same de decision. But instead of following the letter of his religious dogma that he lives under, he chooses instead a Torah of kindness. The Pharisees interpreted this situation as even an obligation of the high priest. If he comes upon a corpse, oral law says he cannot pass it by. It is his duty. It is his obligation to bury the corpse, to take care of it because there's no one else. That's what oral law says. So a Pharisee would not have gone around 
only a Sadducee. But the Samaritan, at this point, he agrees with the oral law. He says, this is a Torah of kindness. There's no one else here. I have to tend to this man because no one else can. But if you look at the body of the Torah concerning defilement of priests and Levites, sometimes a priest has to defile himself in order to bring cleanness and salvation to the whole community of Israel. Look at the red heifer. The one who goes out and who burns the red heifer becomes defiled. But through the ashes of the dead red heifer, available to the whole community of Israel, is cleansing from the realm of death. You've come into contact with death. You come, you're sprinkled with these ashes, the water and the ashes. You're clean again. So the priest obligation is sometimes to incur uncleanness, to bring cleanness to the whole community. That is looking at the whole picture of the Torah, not pulling one verse out and saying, this is the one I like, and this is the one I will observe. That's the picture of the coming Messiah. He went into a realm of uncleanness, like the priest burning the red heifer, so that he could make cleanness available to all of us. Another person who was part of Jericho's history is Zacchaeus. Remember, he was perched up in a fig or a sycamine tree, and we know that it was a fake fig. It produced little false figs. But Zacchaeus, according to what we read in Isaiah 56, did not remain an unfruitful tree. He became a fruitful tree through the work of Yeshua. What else do we know about people from Jericho? They assisted in repairing the walls of Jerusalem in Nehemiah 3.1. It says, Then Eliashiv, the high priest, there's our priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and they built the sheep gate that we read about today, we sang about today. The liturgy and the music couldn't have been more appropriate. They built the sheep gate. They sanctified it and set up the doors of it, even unto the tower of Me'ah. They sanctified it unto the tower of Hananiel. And next unto him built the men of Jericho. With the priests and with the high priest, who rectified, who rebuilt and sanctified the sheep gate for all the sheep, were the men of Jericho, the strong men of Jericho. Also in Jericho, Yeshua gives sight to two blind men. Remember, two is Beit, the house, which is the temple. And although these two men, in their blind state, could not qualify as priests to offer the food of God, when Yeshua got done with them, they were perfect. They were able to draw near because of the bread of life. The Samaritan also gives two coins to the innkeeper. That refers again back to Rahav, the harlot, the innkeeper. These pictures are all joined together. So what is it about Jericho? We see the connection, but what is it? Well, the name itself comes from Yireh, which is another name for the moon. Jericho is the moon city, so to speak. And here is insight into the moon of the millennium. This is incredible. In Isaiah 30, 26, it says, Moreover, talking about the millennial reign of Yeshua, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold, as the light of seven days, and the day that the Lord binds up the breach of his people and heals the stroke of their wound. Yericho is the moon city. Joshua symbolized the moon reflecting the light of the sun because Moshe had to be gathered to his fathers. That sun had to set. The same way that Yeshua said, I have to go to the Father. I have to be gathered to my Father in order for you to do the work in the kingdom on earth that you were called to do. And as long as I'm here, you can't do it because there won't be anything for you to reflect according to my own rules. I have to be gathered to my father the same way that Moshe had to be gathered so that Yehoshua could go to the moon city and that all Israel could begin to reflect the light of the moon into the holy land and therefore to the entire earth. 
And we know that year ago, the moon city was besieged for seven days, seven trumpets, everything in the sevens. The light of the moon, your light, Yisrael, during Yeshua's millennial reign will be seven times brighter than it is right now. You will be seven times more radiant in that day. That is alluding to the actions of the Good Samaritan. It's the Israelite of mixed ancestry who is obedient to a Torah of kindness, who goes beyond the letter of the law to bind up the wounds of the one who is left half dead. That's what that scripture says when the Lord binds up the breach of his people and heals the stroke of their wound. It is up to the one who comes from a mixed ancestry they did descend from Israel in a physical way, but they were all mixed in. And their interpretations were sometimes all mixed up. And their dates of worship were all mixed up. Their times of worship were all mixed up. Their places of worship were all mixed up. But nevertheless, it's that one that comes out of a mixed ancestry, and he begins to bind up the wounds of Israel on the road to Jericho, the moon city. Seven times brighter. You see, right now, you can look at the moon, and what are you going to see? If it's really bright, you're going to see craters. You're going to see the effects of sin in the kingdom on earth. Because the moon looks like it's been through a battle zone, doesn't it? If you've seen the pictures close up, it looks like it has been hit and hit and beaten half to death. But Yeshua came up to bind up those wounds. Right now, even when we shine our brightest, you can still see the craters and the blemishes, can't you? No matter how happy we are in Messiah, people still look at it. They'll see the light, but they're going to see the blemishes, you know, where we've just been hit, hit, hit with sin, grief, pain, suffering, all those things from that realm that we were born into. But when Messiah comes... Our light is going to be increased seven times and he's going to heal up those blemishes and the moon will be whole like it once was before we fell into the realm of sin, death, pain, and suffering. We will not have to reflect those things anymore because all creation will be repaired. The moon is groaning for its repair the same way that we are. But our defects will disappear and we are all on the road to Jericho. We are all going to the moon city. We have been ambushed. We have been robbed of our inheritance in the covenants. And we have been left for dead. We have been a barren land. A water that could not produce. But now we have encountered something. Someone, our neighbor, neighbor and he remains someone who's close to you. A neighbor has stopped and said, I will bind up the wounds. And this goes along with what Wayne was preaching on last week. We have been too quick to accuse the people in the churches of being blemished and not quick enough to bind up the wounds, to pour in the oil and the wine. Because if you are the one coming from a mixed ancestry coming out and you see the light and you realize if I don't do it, nobody else will, then it's your obligation to take that man half dead, take him to the inn, Pour in oil, pour in wine, restore him, make him whole, the same way that Yeshua did to you, to be his neighbor. It is the one who showed kindness who was the neighbor, not the one who was ambushed. The one who has the power to do good is the good neighbor. Jericho was the first city to be conquered for Israel to pass into the promised land. And we know that Hashem declares the end from the beginning. So if in the beginning Jericho was the first, then it's very possible that Jericho will be the first thing in this generation that will have to be conquered and that will have to be dedicated and consecrated to Israel in order for things to proceed so that the entire land can be purified and made holy. What was first will be the end of our faith. Yericho must be transformed to reflect. It must be the light of the moon that reflects the light of the sun. We have to be transformed from blind men, from dry and fruitful trees, into fruitful, doubly fruitful people in the kingdom. 
We have to serve as slaves and royal priests in the household of holiness. We will be full moons shining seven times brighter because we are going to see Yeshua as he is. We are going to see him seven times the radiance. And so we will also reflect seven times the radiance. What's, what's a painful reminder to us that we have not yet reached that state is that all over the land of Israel right now and in the city of Jericho, there are little moons all over. Towers, hundreds of towers with little new moons at the top of the tower. Islam is a moon city that is going to have to be conquered, destroyed, and then consecrated once again to Hashem. And I think it may very well be that Islam is one of the first things that's going to have to be broken down in the city of Jericho, in the moon cities, in order for that land to be cleansed and prepared for what comes next. Every mosque lifts up that little new moon. What about the waters of Jericho? We read about that in, in the reading from the Haftorah. Until the mid-1900s, like I said, Jericho was a wasteland. Just before the destruction of the temple, it's beautiful. It's a wasteland for 1,800 years. goes back to the prophecy of the 18. And then we know that finding it in a ruinous condition. The Israelites come back in, and now, here's a quote, it is unsurpassed in fertility, there is an abundance of water for irrigation, and many of the old aqueducts are almost perfect. Now, it looks much different now, because the first fruits have gone in and begun to make repairs. Now, I'm going to run through this hop tour very quickly, I want you to listen carefully to how many times either the number two is mentioned or you get the double portion allusion, talking about doubles, or something to be rent in two. Every one of those things boils down to a two. Two four. It says, And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho, and the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from your head today? And he said, Yeah, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Terry, I pray thee, hear, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off. And they too stood by Jordan. And Eliah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. A double portion. Who was to receive the double portion? Ephraim. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing, nevertheless. If you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so unto you. But if not, it shall not be so. Did the disciples see Yeshua ascend? And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Eliah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. And he took the mantle of Eliah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also smitten the waters, they parted hither, thither, and Elisha went over. 
And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, The spirit of Eliah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him, and bowed themselves to the ground before him. And they said unto him, Behold now, there be with thy servants fifty strong men. What does that mean? There's a mystery there. There's a division. But there's also fifty strong men. Remember, Joshua, Yehoshua, it says, was the son of Nun. What is the son of Nun? Nun is a Hebrew letter. It has a value of 50. So these sons of the prophets are Nun. They are 50. Nun means fish, posterity, offspring, fertility. Interesting. Remember, Joshua was the secret of making the moon full and complete by being the son of Nun, 50. Nun is the mystery of the moon when it is full by the means of the fullness of Hashem's covenants and His promises. When the moon